Christopher does not understand how this is logically possible and considers theories about whom the letters could be from, believing he has discovered another mystery to solve. So why do you think it's hard for Christopher to imagine what we might immediately recognize, which is these are in fact from his mother? Why does he not go there? Yeah. He's been told by his parents to like always, like always the truth. So he didn't like. There's nothing but it. He doesn't know about lying or any of that. So he's always gonna believe whatever his dad and mom would say to him. Absolutely, Sonica. Yeah, I was gonna say like he has a hard time imagining things that aren't there. That's why he doesn't like fictional books. So maybe he just doesn't think about the possibilities of things that he didn't already know to be true. Absolutely. And he's very logical with everything that he thinks about. So like logically, it would be impossible for the letters to be from his mom since his mom's dead. Yes, of course. I think he also doesn't understand like um, complex like human emotions, and I don't think he would understand like his dad's grief and what caused him to lie at that moment. So I don't think he would talk out the line immediately. Yeah, these are all really great points, um, and it sort of suggests a lot about how Christopher interprets the world, right? Um, this idea of lying is very foreign to him. Not only is it something that he's kind of without saying it like morally against, but um, it just doesn't make sense to him. It's not something he can really comprehend logically or rationally. And so, it makes sense then, in our minds as the reader, why he wouldn't immediately recognize the fact that yes, his mom indeed wrote these letters and his dad had been hiding them from him the whole time. So moving on, now we get to uh, the next section which you were to have read for today, and that is pages 100 to 126. And in this section, Christopher goes through the box of letters and realizes his mother isn't dead. And so he kind of comes to the conclusion that, wait, there is in fact another possibility here. And it's that my mom wrote these. It's my mom who was actually authoring these letters, right? So he becomes physically ill at the news because it means his father lied. And so there's two really important things going on here, right? Number one, the realization that his mother is not dead but alive. And number two, the realization that his father lied. And going deeper with that second point, and I'm sure a lot of us can relate to this, when someone lies to you once, it's hard not to question perhaps what else they've lied about, right? That's a problem with lying. It's hard to isolate the incident, right? How many of us have been lied to and then all of a sudden we're like, well, gosh, in the back of our minds, what else has that person lied about? You know, were they being truthful about this? Were they perhaps misleading me about that? And so this is a really traumatic moment for Christopher and we haven't even gotten to the dog yet. So let's just pause here and think about what ways is Haddon commenting on anxiety here? Because we tend to think of anxiety as being kind of just up here in our heads, but often it has a very physical reaction. And Haddon already does a great job at describing Asperger syndrome. How does he also do a pretty good job at describing the effects that anxiety, especially anxiety resulting from this kind of trauma, can have on us. Any thoughts there? So think about this in terms of both sort of the mental confusion, disorientation, as well as the physical effects. Like what physical effects does this experience have on Christopher? Yeah, Ian? Oh, uh, you like. Blacks out, kind of starts like throwing up. Yeah, 
I think he starts to like contemplate what he's going to do with his life. Like he's starting to think, I don't think I can stay in my house anymore. Like, what am I gonna go do next? Right. So it obviously causes him nausea, right? Um, it even causes him to momentarily black out. And when he comes out of that, he's still stuck in this fight or flight mode. And of course, what does he choose to do? Yeah, flight. Um, and so he immediately recognizes the need to get out of that house. And another important point here is that it's not like he can go to his mom and be like, hey, dad has lost it. I need someone safe. I'm gonna sort of attach myself to you right now. He can't even do that with an older sibling. It's just him and his dad. And so that poses an even greater threat prompting him to leave. But there's one more really important thing that happens, and that's that in an effort to kind of um, explain why he lied about the mom, he also confesses about Wellington. And I don't need to tell you this. What happened to Wellington? Sat by a pitchfork by his father, right? And so again, like, Let's break this down. There's more than one thing happening here, right? So on the surface, this is the third sort of traumatic thing that Christopher has to now experience within the matter of just a few minutes, okay? Furthermore, not only did his father kill Wellington, but killed him in a pretty gruesome manner, right? literally stabbed a dog with a pitchfork. Um, now, I wouldn't advocate for killing any dogs, um, or animals for that matter, being vegan, but uh, I especially would not advocate for killing a dog, your neighbor's dog, with a pitchfork. And so, let's just be honest here. Like, knowing now that Christopher is going to run away, we tend to kind of criticize those actions as irrational or impulsive, but in this case, is it? Like, do you think it's irrational or impulsive, or is this something you would at least consider, if not do, if you were 14 and this was your home life? I mean, no right or wrong answer here, just give me your thoughts. Yeah. I think it's rational, because I think uh, having tries like, really hard to represent individualism. And I think with him, because sometimes for some people, like trauma hides itself and like you recognize that later on, but for him, all his trauma kind of hit him at once and he recognized it. And I think like his reaction to that, which was like heavy anxiety and like physical illness and like physical pain, I think it was a warranted reaction to run away. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. Um, again, not that I necessarily advocate for running away, but Christopher's mind also works a little bit differently than ours. And Christopher is sort of unable to process or comprehend the more abstract reasons that perhaps led to the murder of Wellington, right? So what I mean by that specifically is Christopher, even if he was told this, doesn't necessarily appreciate that, you know, this was the dog of um, the husband uh, whom his wife uh, cheated on him with, right? So there's a motivation there. Again, not excusing it, but Christopher can't even appreciate that and so it sort of heightens the fear that he's already experiencing. Does that make sense? When you can only process like fear or no fear, and you don't have any abstractions to kind of qualify that fear, then yeah, the fear weighs heavier on you and affects your decisions in a more powerful way. 
So let's kind of pause here and let's go back to uh, some of the questions um, specifically for this section, so pages 100 to 126. Because even though this section um, was relatively short and the majority of it was us sort of reading the letters of Christopher's mom, there's a lot revealed in those letters and the way in which Christopher and his dad both react to those letters and finding them reveals a lot about them as well. So we've already kind of talked about number one in terms of Ed Boon being a round character. And because this is also a composition class, I'm really interested in number two, which is why do you think the author chose to riddle Judy Boone's letters with spelling and grammatical errors? Because some of you mentioned like not only were these poor mechanically, but they didn't really make sense in terms of their flow, right? Judy kind of jumped from one idea to the next and so, what purpose does this serve in the novel as it relates to character? So, in other words, what does this reveal about Judy's character? That's a tough question. Well, what did you guys put for that one? Yeah, Omar? I believe it represents like Judy's emotions when she's writing it, mm -hmm. because like it shows how because like a lot of people, whenever they're like emotional and a lot's going on in their head, they tend to misspell words or they tend to like miss some grammar. And I think that's like a really like fair way to represent it without pushing it into like the reader's face. Absolutely. Am I reading it? Add anything? Something somewhere. I said like uh, it was just a show like it was like a truly handwritten paper. Uh, like obviously like they're writing with a paper and pencil. There's no autocorrect, so the mistakes are there. Right. Um, and writing it rather than typing it, I guess it shows like that she's affectionate, affectionate, so like loving, like she still cares for him. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're both offering really good points there, um, especially the one about how emotion sometimes um, causes us to misspell things, right? Um, so I know, and I'll just be honest here. You know, when I'm um, when I'm texting someone that I'm kind of interested in. Um, it would make sense theoretically that I would really proofread those messages, right? Like I would not hit send until everything is perfect, right? Um, but the problem is like you get excited and you get caught up in a conversation. And so I tend, or at least I feel this way, to have more errors when I'm just having a good conversation with someone I'm interested in than when I'm, um, not so much interested in them, or when I'm, you know, just uh, sending a professional email. And I kind of think the same thing's going on here, right? Judy is assuming that Christopher is reading these despite him not necessarily returning the favor. And, you know, she's passionate, she's expressive, and she's more concerned with expressing that than sort of um, having it look or appear super scripted, right? And I think there's something kind of charming in that, right? But I also think that this reveals something even deeper. And so I think that it reveals she's probably not as educated or as sophisticated as others who might, you know, spend a little bit more time writing their letters. And I think that this could also be an explanation for why perhaps she was unable to care for her special needs child. Now, we can debate all day whether or not that's an excuse, right? Some people would argue, okay, you gave birth to this child and you need to deal with it. All children are hard to raise at times. But I think others of us might look at this and be like, yeah, you know, maybe she just didn't have as much 
um, grit or um, willpower to really like push through how difficult this was. Um, so I think we can definitely kind of come to the conclusion with that there. Um, the next thing is, do you accept Judy Bloom's explanation um, of why she left? Yeah, let's make sure it's still working. Um, maybe just wiggle the mouse a little bit. I assume it's still recording, but uh, perfect. Um, is it working? Oh, it's working. I hope not. Hmm. Now it's just going to zoom right in on my face. 